All right, so in this lecture, we're going to learn about uh, eigen decomposition and uh, how that's used in principal components analysis. And this is going to be an important um, groundwork understanding for the next lecture, which will be about using generalized eigen decomposition for uh, spatial filtering, components analysis, and uh, data reduction techniques. So <clears throat> let's start by thinking about uh, matrix vector product. So here we have a matrix A and a vector V. And uh, these are the right sizes to be able to multiply. So we can multiply uh, A times V. Um, so how does this work? So we do this. So it's 1 times minus 1 plus uh, 1 times 1. And that's going to be the first component. And the second component will be 0 times minus 1 plus uh, 3 times uh, one. You can also think of this as being the dot product, or each component in the resulting vector is going to be the dot product between each row in A and each column in uh, V. Anyway, so here is the result. This is the, 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 the matrix vector product AV. So, but what does this mean? How do we um, uh, interpret what, the, what this result means? So, of course, this is a two-dimensional example, so we can plot these vectors in two dimensions. So here's our vector uh, V, that's this guy here. <clears throat> and now here's our vector AV. Um, so you can see it, uh, well, it just happens to point straight up. So essentially what we've done is we've taken a, um, a one vector, multiplied it by a matrix, and that sort of shot the vector off into a different direction. So it now points in a different direction from the original vector. This is actually the purpose of um, matrix vector multiplication. So for example, A might contain some kind of uh, linear transformation that you want to apply. Um, so this is used, for example, all the time in, uh, in like uh, uh, computer graphics to you know, change the, the visual perspective of, uh, of an image. But the important concept here is that when you take a vector and multiply it by a matrix, it's going to point in some other direction. This is true for the like overwhelming vast majority of combinations of uh, matrices and vectors. Right, so now let's do something else. So now let's take the same matrix, uh, again multiply it by a vector, but this is going to be a different vector from the previous one. And now the result is um, 3, 6, so that's just, you know, uh, again the same uh, uh, computations, the, uh, um, each component is the dot product between this row and A and, and V, but now we can visualize uh, this guy. And now this is kind of interesting, so now the resulting vector, AV, is on the same line. If you imagine uh, like an infinite, um, infinitely long line, so a, a subspace that goes like this, and now what we've done with this matrix is, um, is, is we just stretched this vector that was the effect of multiplying this matrix by this vector. It was just to take that original vector and stretch it a little bit. So this is a very special case and it's very rare. It's a, it, this is not a property of the matrix and it's not a property of the vector. It's a property of this particular combination between uh, this matrix th with these particular numbers and this particular uh, vector. So this thing um, is called an eigenvector. It's called an eigenvector because when we multiply um, A by this, or a matrix by this special vector, the result is the same vector. It's pointing in the same direction. It's just scaled, so it's stretched a little bit or Maybe for a different vector, it would be a little bit shorter. Uh, maybe it would even point in the other direction, but that's okay. It still goes on this same line. So that's why it's called an eigenvector. So these eigenvectors are, um, are special things, and there's a lot of um, important uh, ways of looking at a matrix that involve finding the eigenvectors. So here's just another picture of this. So here's um, our um, two by two matrix, and here's a vector, and then we multiply matrix A by vector V, and we get vector AV, and now AV points off in some other direction compared to the original vector. So this is not an eigenvector. And here we have an eigenvector, 
where uh, the vector v points, um, uh, sorry, the vector av points in the same direction as vector v. So the reason why this is neat. So let me let me show. So this is uh, the standard eigenvalue equation which you may have seen before. So this is a matrix times a vector equals uh, a scalar times that same vector. So this vector x is called the eigenvector, and this scalar, this lambda, this is called the eigenvalue. And this is just a single number. So what this means is that multiplying this matrix by the vector is exactly the same as multiplying a single number by that vector. So that's what you see here. Uh, the, the resulting vector just got a little bit longer. So it was like, it's just a scaled version of that. So this lambda is the scalar. So for a two by two matrix, that might not seem very impressive, but if you think about like a 1000 by 1000 matrix and we multiply it by a 1000 by one, you know, 1000 element uh, vector, that's, you know, the, the amount of multiplications and additions that's involved in computing that uh, matrix vector multiplication is in the billions. Um, but actually for this special vector, multiplying that huge matrix by this long vector is exactly the same as multiplying a single number by that uh, vector. So that's pretty neat. So matrices don't have only uh, one eigenvector. They have as many eigenvectors as there are columns or rows in uh, in the matrix. Um, of course, it's not the case that, that one eigenvector corresponds to, to one column. It's just that the number happens to be the same. So now this is for um, a single eigenvector. When we talk about the whole set of eigenvectors, um, it's it's often capitalized. I don't know why I had X here and W here, but people use different letters, I guess. Uh, but this, they often use the same thing. So this is a capital lambda, and this indicates uh, a matrix, which is all zeros except on the diagonals, and each diagonal element contains one of these uh, lambdas. So now let's go back to this example. So here's this matrix. Uh, a and our vector v, and then this was the product. So now you can actually see that this is just a scaled up version of this. So this vector v is an eigenvector of this matrix. Um, and so what would the eigenvalue be here? Of course, the eigenvalue is 3. We just multiply this vector by 3, and then we get this vector. So, um, so it turns out, so first of all, I should mention that eigen decomposition is something that, so eigen decomposition is the procedure of finding the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. Um, there's uh, a few interesting ways of going about finding these eigenvectors and eigenvalues by hand, although in practice, you would never do something like this for, uh, for real data. Uh, otherwise, you know, you would spend 10 years just computing one eigen decomposition of a 64 by 64 matrix. Anyway, um, so in, in MATLAB, it's a simple function. Um, so uh, eigen decomposition is something that can only be applied to a um, square matrix. But remember, there are, there's a special class of square matrices called symmetric matrices. And that's where all of the elements in the lower um, uh, diagonal are the same as on the upper diagonal. So actually, this is not a symmetric matrix, right? Because these two guys are, are different. But when you do an eigen decomposition of a square symmetric matrix, you get some interesting um, properties of the eigen vectors. <coughs> um, and those are relevant for, um, for the next uh, discussion. So first of all, all the eigen vectors are orthogonal. That means the dot product between any given pair of eigenvectors is going to be zero. So they all sort of meet at right angles. Another nice feature of an eigen decomposition of a square symmetric matrix is that all the eigenvalues, that are, those are these scalar lambda values, they're all real valued, which means they're not uh, complex. Um, complex eigenvalues are, uh, are fine, they're interpretable, but they're a little bit hard to work with. So it's convenient if, uh, if they are real valued. Um, it also turns out that for square symmetric matrices in MATLAB, uh, the results are always going to be normalized vectors, which means they all have a length of uh, one. That's just something that MATLAB does. Um, and this I already mentioned, but this is my reminder in case I forgot to tell you about this, that 
however many columns you have in the matrix, which is also the number of rows, right, because this is a square matrix, that's the number of eigenvectors that you get. So, <clears throat> but who cares about square matrices? We don't, you know, when we think about the data in neuroscience data, we our data don't come in square matrices. They come in rectangular matrices. So what, what can we, what, what does eigen decomposition do for us? Well, it turns out that we can produce a, um, a square, not only a square matrix, but a square symmetric matrix from any sized uh, or any, any size two dimensional uh, matrix. And I mentioned this briefly in uh, the first lecture on uh, intro to matrix algebra, but I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more now because it's relevant. So in neuroscience, data are often stored as a two-dimensional matrix like this, so channels by time. So now what we do is uh, we can transpose this 2D matrix to get a time by channels uh, matrix. And when we multiply this matrix by this matrix, the result is a channels by channels matrix. So the reason why that works is because if you think about, if you remember the, the rules for matrix multiplication, the inner dimensions have to match and the outer dimensions define the sizes of the uh, resulting product matrix. So here we have M by N and then we transpose it to get N by M and that gives us our M by M matrix. So that gives us a square symmetric matrix and we can perform an eigen decomposition not on the original data matrix, but on this uh, matrix of the, mat uh, the, uh, the data matrix times its transpose. So um, how, how do I know that it's, uh, that it's a symmetric matrix? The fact that it's a square matrix is obvious uh, from the rules of matrix multiplication, but this doesn't prove that this is a square matrix. So I'm going to prove that to you now. This is um, a nice proof, and it's also a very uh, short proof, so it's uh, easy to present. The only thing you have to know about uh, linear algebra before understanding this proof is that when you have um, uh, matrices that are being multiplied like this, if you take the transpose of those matrices inside the parentheses, when you, so the way that this works is you apply the transpose to each matrix, but then you have to swap the order. So when you transpose this matrix multiplication of A transpose A, um, then, so you do A transpose, and then this becomes the first matrix, and then A transpose transpose, and that becomes the second matrix. So that you see here, so this is just the rewrite, uh, the, yeah, this is the re rewriting uh, this expression. And now, of course, the matrix transpose transpose is itself. So um, we get this neat result that A transpose A equals A transpose A, or the transpose of A transpose A. So when a matrix is equal to its transpose, that means it's the same thing whether you flip it, um, you know, when you transpose it, which means it's symmetric. So that's the definition of a symmetric matrix. And this is not only about A transpose A, by the way. The same thing works for A, A transpose. So we take the transpose of A, A transpose. So then we transpose this second matrix and swap the order so that becomes the first and then transpose the second uh, the first matrix, which then becomes the second. And we get this and then the A transpose transpose just becomes A again because we flip it twice. And now we get, again, exactly the same um, observation that this matrix times its transpose is uh, symmetric. So it works um, both ways. I still haven't told you why this is remotely interesting for, for us as, uh, as neuroscience data analyzers. The reason why this is interesting is that um, when you take a, uh, a matrix that contains uh, observations by channels, so channels by time, um, the matrix times its transpose is not only square symmetric, this is also something that we call a covariance matrix. And essentially this happens because you're computing the, in this matrix multiplication, you're computing the dot product between the time series from each channel and the time series from every other channel. So that gives you a full matrix of um, covariance uh, matrices. And it works both ways. So you can get in this particular example, A transpose A would be the time covariance 
um, and a, a transpose would give you the channel covariance. Generally in neuroscience, this is the thing that we are more interested in. We're more concerned with the um, channel covariance. This is still a valid covariance, uh, but we, yeah, we don't really tend to, to use this. Now I have to say that um, whether the channel covariance is A, A transpose or A transpose A depends entirely on the organization of the matrix. So if you start with the matrix as time by channels, then in fact it would be A transpose A that gives you the channel covariance. So this is not a necessary mapping. It's important just to keep this um, in mind and, uh, and check the sizes of your matrices. So you know, if you end up with a matrix that's 100,000 by 100,000 and you only have 64 channels, then you probably just uh, have to f flip, you know, flip the matrices the other way to get the channel covariance. So, um, so now what happens? So now we have this uh, eigenvalue equation, but now we replace A with, uh, well, A transpose A or A A transpose. So this is two matrices or the same matrix that's transposed multiplying each other. But you can still think of this as just a single matrix, right? When you multiply these out, you'll get just a single matrix. So this is still the same equation. We're just defining that this matrix is going to be square symmetric. And now the reason why this is interesting is that if A is a data matrix and A transpose A or A, a transpose is the covariance matrix, then uh, this eigen decomposition gives us something special. The vectors, the eigenvectors, point to the biggest directions of variance in this covariance matrix. Um, in other words, so it points in the principal directions, which are also called principal components. So in fact, this is a principal components analysis. This is how you do a principal components analysis. You simply take the eigen decomposition of the um, channel by channel covariance matrix of, uh, of some data. This is how it looks in MATLAB. So it's the function eig that does the eigen decomposition. And you can see inside the, the eig function, here we just have uh, one input. Um, you'll see in the next lecture that we're going to have uh, two inputs in here. But here we just have uh, one input, which is a single matrix. It's a covariance matrix of A transpose times A. And then what MATLAB uh, returns is a, a matrix of the eigenvectors and a matrix of the eigenvalues. So very important. Um, the data must have zero mean before computing the, the covariance matrix. This is um, an easy step to forget, but it's a very important step to do because if, if the data do not have zero mean, then uh, the, the, the first eigenvector is actually just going to point in the direction of the mean offset, which is not very interesting. In fact, it can be very misleading. Um, so these, our data sets in neuroscience generally do not have um, a zero mean to start with. So you always have to um, subtract the mean before computing the covariance matrix. We'll see this in uh, MATLAB in a few minutes. So here we see an example of, uh, of principal components analysis. Here is, um, so you know, these are some two-dimensional data. So you can imagine we were recording from two channels. So channel X and channel Y. And imagine that each of these dots is a time point. So here we're measuring over a couple hundred uh, time points. And here's the data. Um, you can see these data are correlated, but you can also see that, you know, this, X, Y axis, the way we set up these axes, is not really the ideal way to um, characterize these data because the variance in the data do not go along these dimensions. Instead, the, the variance in the data very clearly goes along these directions. So this is the first, you know, the, the direction of most variance, and this is the direction of, uh, of the, the, well, the next direction of variance. So in, in fact, these are the eigenvectors here. So um, the way we would do, so doing a principal components analysis on these, this data set would involve um, computing the uh, covariance of these uh, data. So that gives you a two by two symmetric matrix. Taking the eigen decomposition, and these are the eigenvectors. So this is the first uh, 
um, or I should say the eigenvector associated with the largest eigenvalue and the next uh, eigenvector uh, with the next eigenvalue. Now, if we didn't subtract the mean from these data, if we left a mean offset in these data, this cloud would not be centered at zero. This cloud would be, you know, for example, it might be translated up here. So we might see the cloud up here. And then the first uh, eigenvector would actually point towards that cloud. So if this cloud were up here, you could see that this, the first vector going up this way would not be an accurate class. Well, technically it's accurate, but it wouldn't be a very useful classification of this. Okay. <clears throat> and what you see over here is just these same data, but they've been now rotated to be in principal component space rather than in the original um, XY space, which is channel by channel space. So this is the first uh, component and the, and the second component. All right, so let's have a look at this in uh, MATLAB. Here, just to show you, so here we have our matrix A and, and, uh, uh, and now we're gonna perform an uh, eigen decomposition of this matrix. And then here is uh, one vector V, which is not an eigenvector. I just made up these numbers. And then uh, vector two is going to be an eigenvector. Um, this is important. So the, the vectors are, uh, the vectors always go in columns. They're stored in the columns, not in the rows of this, uh, of this matrix. So it's important if you go, this is also tricky because if you do this, then technically, I mean, that, that's wrong in a sort of mathematical sense, in the sense that this is not a meaningful vector. Uh, but it's not wrong in a in a, uh, map, in a in a programming sense. It, it, <laughs> how to say this? This will not produce a MATLAB error, although it is the wrong result. So you always have to be careful of this. It has to go in this direction. So can generate this plot. This is just the same plot that uh, that I showed uh, that figure of. Um, so I'll let you go through this code uh, line by line. Here what we're going to do is simulate some data. So we generate some random numbers. And this is how I generate this, uh, these correlated numbers here. So um, first generate these, uh, these numbers to be uh, compressed along one direction. So uh, anisotropic, you might call it. Um, and then I apply this uh, rotation matrix. Um, so this is just the, the way to get a uh, a rotation matrix in two dimensions. So it's going to rotate these data by uh, pi over four. And here you see the rotation. So in fact, the rotation is implemented as a uh, matrix multiplication. And then uh, here, this is important. So here we, um, we uh, so here we, we want to compute the principal components analysis. So we take the eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix the covariance matrix is y transpose times y. Um, and that is the right thing to do in this case, just because of the way that that y is. So if these were, were EEG data, for example, this would be 2,000 time points and two channels. So that's why we want to flip it first and then take uh, and then multiply it by the original matrix. Um, and here is the important line where we subtract the mean. So I'm using this BSS, BSX fun function to uh, subtract the mean uh, value from, the, um, from the, the data. All right, so actually this just reproduces the same thing that I showed in the slide, but at least now you can see how it works, um, what it looks like, um, and you can back the code. And here again, we take the column, so it's always the second dimension from these uh, eigenvector matrices, not the rows. It's easy to forget. So I like to call the outputs of this um, eig function vex and vals, um, because that makes it very obvious which ones are the vectors and the, and the values. But sometimes when you see code, you know, people might write uh, sometimes like v and d. So v for the vectors and d because it's a diagonal matrix, we can uh, I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, so that's fine. Or you might see like W and L. So the W would be the vectors and L is for lambda. 
So the point is it's easy to forget um, which uh, output is the vectors and which are the values, but it's important to know. So if you're ever confused, you can just you can make images of of these and see the eigen uh, vectors are always going to look a bit like uh, I don't know. It, well, it looks like noise. Of course, it's not noise, but you know, it's a full matrix. Um, and here are the eigen values. And here you see uh, this is a zeros matrix. So it's a diagonal matrix. It's all zeros, um, and it's non-zeros on the diagonal. And um, and the value at each of these diagonal elements is the um, corresponding eigenvalue. So this is the eigenvalue for this eigenvector, and this is the eigenvalue for this eigenvector. And you can see the colors are getting deeper here um, because they are, um, in this case, they're sorted in increasing order. So um, it may seem a little counterintuitive at first, but MATLAB uh, often spits out these uh, matrices to be um, or such that the, the last column is the most important, so the, the first principal components. So when you have, so the reason that they come out sorted in this case is not because MATLAB sorts uh, these um, eigenvectors and eigenvalues. It just happens to work out like that most of the time because of the way that MATLAB um, uh, estimates these um, eigenvalues. So that's important to know because you shouldn't trust, so you can expect that the eigenvalues will be sorted ascending like this, but you shouldn't trust it. Um, so it's possible that, you know, the largest eigenvalue, which would mean the corresponding vector is the most important one. Uh, that might be somewhere in the middle or it might be in the beginning. So it's just something to be uh, aware of. All right. So here in the cell, we're going to see a principal components analysis on a um, on a on some real data so first we're going to compute two covariance matrices so we load in the sample data that we always use um, and we're going to compute a principal components analysis two different ways once based on just the erp which is the time domain average and once based on all the single trial data so here based on the erp so here we compute the erp um, again, subtract the mean, that's very important. And here you can see now we're doing this, um, the, computing the covariance matrix as the data times its transpose, not the other way around. So we can, and if you're unsure, it's totally natural. In fact, I'm often unsure myself. So you just look at the size, this is right, right? It should be, we have 64 channels, so it should be 64 by 64. This is technically still correct, uh, but this is not the thing we want. We want to look at the covariance over electrodes. All right. I didn't mention this in the lecture, but dividing by dividing the covariance matrix by um, n minus one is just a, a normalization factor. So, for many applications, this is not technically necessary, but it's you know it's nice to just be in the habit of um, dividing by um, the number of points uh, minus one. For example, this is really useful if you want to compare um, different covariance matrices that were computed from data of different lengths, then they would need to be normalized somehow. All right, so that's for the ERP. The, uh, from the single trial um, EEG, it's the same procedure, except we have to, to loop over trials to do this. Technically, we don't actually need to, to loop over trials. We could have done this without the loop, but I think it's a bit more clear here. So here we take, um, again, subtract the effort, uh, yeah, subtract the, the, the mean. Um, so it has zero mean. Uh, and now we're just doing it for each trial. And then we compute the covariance is equal to itself plus the new covariance just from that trial. Uh, and then we divide by the number of trials. So these two covariance matrices are, are not the same, right? They, they look different, they're noticeably different. This you can think of as being like the, the, the phase-locked covariance or the evoked covariance. And this has a lot more information in it. This is the, the total um, uh, covariance. So it includes the phase-locked signals and it also includes the non-phase-locked signals. All right, and now we're going to um, compute a principal components analysis of these two matrices. And here you can see the first component from the ERP and from the EEG. 
Uh, so the, all the single trial data. So you can see they're clearly not uh, identical, right? So they, they're they sensitive to slightly different things. So this means, you know, the way you interpret this difference is that there is more um, sort of patterns of covariance that are a little bit more anterior um, at the single trial level that you don't necessarily see, you know, so, so basically some of these are, are getting... Um, uh, washed out in the averaging process. So this is just what's left from the time domain average. So now we have, this is like a, a visual depiction of the first component. And uh, and again, you can see it's it's the last one in the matrix. And, you know, you can also look at uh, like these, the penultimate uh, component, or you might call this the second component. Um, this one looks more similar, actually, between these two guys. Well, it's still a bit noticeably different. So, and now what we're going to do is is get the principal component time course. So, and we just get that by treating um, this eigenvector as a weight. So, this is like a, a weighting matrix. This is a, would be the visual representation of the weighting matrix. Let me go back and undo this. And now we're going to um, take the, the weighted average of all the activity from all the electrodes um, and uh, uh, and that gives us a single time course. So we get one component that reflects the data from all 64 electrodes, uh, but the 64 electrodes are weighted and the weighting is determined by the eigenvector. So that's why this is also, that's why it's called a components analysis because we get uh, one component that's a weighting of all the electrodes. So now you can see this is um, now so that so then we, we do this and then compute the ERP. So this is the ERP um, of uh, the the first principal component that was computed from the ERP and the ERP from the first principal component that was computed based on the single trial data. In this case, they are extremely similar, which should not be so surprising. Um, because we are still, first of all, because the, the, the patterns of weights are fairly similar. So there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of similarity. There's a lot of overlap between the weighting on this component and the weighting for this component. And also, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, global large scale features that, that dominate the ERP. So if we were to use these uh, components to do like a time frequency analysis where we're sensitive to um, a lot more of the signal inside the EEG data, uh, the results would look fairly different. So, anyway. So now I would like to talk about uh, the primary feature of principal components analysis, which is, um, which is often a disadvantage for, um, for neuroscience data. The feature, which I already mentioned before, is that um, with an eigen decomposition of a, of a symmetric matrix, the um, eigenvectors are all pairwise orthogonal. They're, they're forced to be um, pairwise orthogonal, certainly for, you know, like, uh, well, that gets in, I won't get into those details. Anyway, all the principal components are always going to be orthogonal, regardless of what's happening in the data. The components have to be uh, orthogonal to each other. Sometimes that's fine, but for some data sets, that's suboptimal because the data are themselves uh, not um, organized in an orthogonal way. So here you see some data, and actually you've you, you, it's likely that you've seen a figure, uh, maybe not this exact figure, but something that looks like this. People often use this example to illustrate the difference between principal components analysis and independent components analysis. Uh, so here we have um, data, and it is very clear that there is uh, structure in these data, but it's also very clear that the, the real structure in these data is not orthogonal. They're, these data are, um, are, are correlated in a sort of, well, in like an X-shaped way. But a principal components analysis is going to say that this direction is the, the important direction, the first important direction, and this direction is the next one. Now, that's not wrong, per se, because that's sort of, it's doing the right thing, but uh, or it's doing what it's supposed to do, I guess. 
Um, but you can see that it's also not really characterizing the data very well. Now, independent components analysis is a totally different uh, technique. It's, it's not the same thing as principal components analysis. Um, it, people often think that they're similar because the names are very similar. Um, but it's a very different uh, technique and uh, it involves uh, different uh, algorithms. But an independent components analysis does not have this orthogonality uh, constraint. So you can see that an independent components analysis was very um, easily able to find that this direction and this direction are the two, um, the two main axes of variance. So you can see here's the data in principal component space. It's just like uh, like these data, but rotated, um, versus the data in independent component space. And here, the data independent components analysis really did a good job of of um, like uncoupling these uh, these two um, patterns of uh, of covariance. So I want to be clear that um, about what this means and what it doesn't mean. So this does mean that principal components analysis is uh is is often though not always but it's often not very useful in neuroscience and the reason why it's often not very useful in neuroscience is because many of the things that we want to measure in the brain are not orthogonal you know they they have more of a structure that's like this it's independent but not orthogonal so principal components analysis is not going to give the optimal results for um, in these situations. But I want to make sure that it's clear that this is not a problem with eigen decomposition. It's not a limitation of eigen decomposition per se. And we're going to see in the next lecture how we can use um, eigen decomposition to, um, first of all, to relax uh, this orthogonality constraint and, uh, and do very sort of uh, incisive and informative and powerful uh, components analyses and data reduction techniques without using uh, independent components analysis. So um, let's see this uh, very quickly. So this is code <coughs> uh, that just reproduces that figure, of course. And uh, yeah, I won't go into the details of this code so much. Most of this is stuff you've seen uh, before. This, the independent components analysis is done from uh, using this uh, function called Jade, um, which is, uh, and the R is for for real because it's a special case of the Jade ICA uh, algorithm for real valued inputs, which is what we have here. Um, so this, um, you can find this algorithm, this MATLAB uh, function, you can find on the internet, it's also included in the um, EEG lab uh, toolbox, and it's also uh, on this website here, on my website, so you can uh, download it. So uh, let's see, I think that was it. So I hope you found that um, informative about um, uh, the, the concept of eigen decomposition and how we use that for principal components analysis, and uh, see you in the next lecture.